So welcome everybody out there in Cyberland and special welcome to Ivan Augustine from Elsie Booktook First Nation. My name is Pamela Fowler and I will be interviewing Ivan uh, today. And before I do that, I would like to acknowledge that Ivan and I are both on, uh, we're chatting from miles apart, but we are both on um, different regions of the ancestral territory of the Mi'kmaq. And uh, some of you might be watching from other regions, maybe the Passamakati or the Wollastuk territories. We're all covered by the Treaties of Peace and Friendship. And I'd like to acknowledge that and that the Department of Education is committed to honoring um, these treaties and ensuring that an Indigenous perspective is brought into um, all the courses. And today we're going to highlight environmental science and sciences in general with um, Ivan's experiences living and growing up in the Rishabukto watershed and particularly Elsie Booktook First Nation. So welcome Ivan. Uh, we are honored to have you take some time out of your busy schedule to be with Thank us. You. So as a little outline, so you know what's coming down the wire, I'm going to uh, talk about uh, the watershed, of course, and we'll take a look back through Ivan's childhood, which wasn't that long ago. Maybe we no. can go a little further back than that and um, speak about stories that he recalls from his parents or even grandparents. And uh, Specifically, I'm going to be asking Ivan how he appreciates the land as a teacher and how we might learn from her uh, moving forward in education. And we'll finish by saying a thank you again. So Ivan, again, welcome. And I just have here on the screen where you are. I'm way down to the south of you, but it's nice to see you right here on my screen. Um, you are along the beautiful banks of the Rishabukto, and uh, we see here the watershed sort of delineated for us, and it pays no attention to the political boundaries or the county lines that we see perfectly straight um, on the map here in front of us. So talk to us, Ivan, have you always lived in Elsie Booktook? And uh, tell us a little bit about what it was like growing up in the watershed. Yes, uh, <clears throat> thank you for having me. Um, yes, I, I've um, lived all my life in here in Elzebukto First Nation. Um, at the time, it was Biko, Biko Indian Reserve. And uh, as you could see on the map there, um, that's where I grew up in the, around the Rishabakta watershed, uh, growing up. Um, in the uh, summer times, uh, we spent a lot, a lot, of, you know, ninety percent of our time uh, by the shores uh, because of swimming. And we, you know, it was an everyday activity that we uh, swam, and we didn't have to go that far to go swimming. And we had uh, beautiful beaches, and they've all changed now over the over the years. Um, but that was mainly our uh, activity in the summer along with um, uh, clam digging, um, you know, when you wanted a, a feast of clams. And there were times that we craved for, for, for clams. You, and uh, as kids, we would all go and, and uh, dig, dig clams and start our own fire by the shore and, and eat the clams. Um, well, another activity we liked to do as well was uh, oysters. And uh, um, we had to, uh, we were we swim and we go to a certain part of the um, the river, Rishabakta River, where it, the channel came very close to the shore. So we we swim out and we we dive maybe eight to ten feet underwater, and uh, we we grab the uh, oysters by the hand, and uh, we bring them up and uh, take them to shore, and we would uh, eat them raw, um, and that's uh, that's. That's all through the summer, the activities that we used to do right along the watershed. 
uh, in the fall, um, there was a, uh, there's a salmon run that comes in uh -huh. um, and uh, we, me per, <clears throat> particularly helped my dad uh, sit a net up into the river and uh, um, we would have um, from the river uh, fresh salmon, uh, bass, um, uh, some mackerel, and then a lot of um, uh, gas, uh, gasparo, I think it's called gasparo, we call it gaspala. And um, that would be a meal that we would have uh, all through the, uh, the, the fall time. And, um, and also freeze, we would also, uh, my parents would also freeze a lot of the fish that they, uh, my dad caught during the uh, fall. Salmon was uh, um, abundant and it was a, a real delicacy at, at the time. It's, uh, we had salmon uh, pretty well all month, every day of October and November and, and had some frozen salmon for the, um, uh, the, during the winter time. As well as when the ice hit, uh, then we do a lot of um, an awful lot of uh, smelt fishing on the ice. That was a, like an everyday activity for us kids. Uh, uh, we go anywhere along the, uh, the, the along, as soon as the ice froze and safe to go, we go anywhere along the <clears throat> along the river and make our own holes off the ice. And we wouldn't have shacks uh, uh, like they do uh, today. In fact, when I first seen a shack of ice fish ice fishing in uh, I believe in the uh, St. John area, I was, I was surprised to see something like that then, because we'd never had shacks. It was, you just stood there, stand, you know, on the ice for three, four hours at a time and, and, and caught an abundance of uh, smelts. And there was a huge, an abundance of smelts co coming into the river. In the, uh, as we, uh, Pam and I mentioned a little bit before we went on the air here, um, we do have also um, like eel spearing in the uh, uh, in the winter time, and it's usually further. If you look on that map there, where the red part of that, where Elzi Buktugis, and to the left of that, that red areas, mm -hmm. that would be areas where the, the eels would all migrate to, uh, because there was a lot more um, of mud. It's called we call it bull gulch. And in the bulgots, that's where the, uh, the eels would um, uh, dig dig into the dig into the mud, dig into the, and um, they would hibernate there for the winter. So um, um, fishermen would go on the ice and and cut uh, a, a, a good size hole on the ice, and with a long spear called nigo, uh, we use those nigo to uh, spear. You don't see the eels because they are under in, in the mud. Yeah. And so um, you use that spear and you just hit a certain part of the bull gulch and it, it sticks right into the uh, bull gulch. And uh, uh, when you hit an eel, you, you would feel that in, in the, um, on the shaft of the niggle. And uh, you twist it around in such a way that you, you, you eventually you haul out that eel and you just leave you know, throw it on the ice and leave it there and keep, keep doing that until you have a, a good meal, uh, a feast that, that you could have with the eels. And, and occasionally you would hold that you, that you uh, cut in the ice. Uh, you, would not, you would not be able to spear any, so you move, you go to another area and cut another one and you keep doing that until you, uh, you find a nice place where there's a good, abundance of eel that are um, inside in the bull gulch and uh, um, you know you, you you spear you know a good number of eels and you and you take them home and you cook them and uh, or you give them out to um, the elders and uh, they enjoy a good feast of meals um, as well as uh, in the winter time as well the fishermen would also um, bring out um, nets for um, for uh, smelts and uh, so, you know, the river itself, the Rishabakta River um, uh, was a real uh, abundant with uh, food fisheries uh, for the community of El Zibuktuk and all of us played a role in, in uh, catching the fish from, from the river. Mm -hmm. In the springtime, of course, uh, growing up um, was always uh, trout fishing. 
and uh, there's an abundance of trout that come in, um, seed trout that come in. Um, and, um, you know, that was real, really, really fun to do. Uh, uh, February and March, I remember being a, a, a kid, a student uh, from, from this building here. And uh, one day uh, after school, just walking home, when I looked and, and I would, and I see the, the river has, the ice has uh, uh, opened up and all the ice is kind of like flowing out of the, um, out, out to the ocean. And uh, to this day, I still even see the, 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 the sun shining off the, uh, the, the blue waters. And the water then was blue. Now it's a little, little more brownish color now, our river, but at the time it was real blue. Um, so I remember run, you know, just being so excited about it, ran straight home and right down to the, right down to the uh, shore. And uh, I fished off um, uh, an, ice, an iceberg that was close to the shore. Not float nowhere, but just just close to the shore that you're able to stand in, and, and uh, that was one of my fondest memories. I I remember to this day because uh, just seeing the sun flickering off the ice, and it was a it's a, a lot of excitement, and you know that uh, summer's coming around, and um, uh, and the spring is spring is here, and we we um, the whole community really fished off the the shores here for for um, for trout and. And uh, it's a good. It's usually a was usually a good trout season. Today we don't see a lot of people uh, fishing too much around here for trout. Uh, it seems like we're going to other places to fish for trout now, and uh, maybe it's because some of the pollutants that got into the into the river. But we're going a lot more up north to um, another First Nation community, uh, Medabanagia uh, or Red Bank. And as well as in the uh, bird church areas, uh, Tabas and Tac, and uh, to do a lot more uh, trout fishing. So um, growing up um, as kids, uh, we spent a lot of time um, on the Rishabaktu watershed, uh, uh, swimming and you know uh, swimming uh, for oysters, digging clams. Um, mm -hmm. In the fall time, we had seasonal fish that we. Uh, we asked kids, we, we would go out and fish because we, we enjoyed it. We, you know, a good majority of us did um, a lot of the uh, uh, seasonal fishing that comes in. Uh, salmon was our favorite. Um, it was a meal that uh, everyone enjoyed in the, in the community. Mm. Super. It certainly sheds a cultural light on the the river and the food that it provides. The one one thing I should say when I'm just looking at that map there uh -huh. um, is um, <clears throat> going towards the north, uh, towards like Indian Island, that area there. Um, I remember my uh, yes, that area there. Uh, we call we call it out Danuk, and um, uh, on the left hand side of that uh, by the. Um, uh, and the uh, yeah around that area, uh, my grandfather would put us on a on a boat, and we would boat all the way up to that area of Danuk, and um, to spend um, the day over there and uh, feast. And one of the things that was very interesting was um, uh, Luskanigan, which is cooked uh, not in a pot or a cooking pan or anything like that it's cooked right in the sand and uh, so my grandmother would make the dough and uh, my grandfather would start a fire and uh, get the fire and he, uh, get the fire going a nice big bonfire and heat up the sand around that area and when he felt the sand was nice and hot then he opened up the area where the the fire was and, we, uh, and move the coals and all that mm -hmm. and, and dig uh, uh, into the sand and just drop the, uh, the bread inside the sand and cover it up with sand and put the fire right over it. And um, we, we, that, that Luskanigan was uh, called Dupkwano Saig. And um, it was good, it was, it was very good bread that, um, uh, you know, I learned from my grandfather, even though I, I haven't done it personally myself, but I, I remember uh, 
what my grandfather did because that was the idea of him taking us there for us to learn some of these uh, skills and traditions that uh, they learned from, from their uh, parents and grandparents. Wow, fantastic. Oh, I love hearing your stories, Ivan. Yeah, they also, as a couple other questions you have there about hunting, we'll talk about my grandfather again. Yes, wonderful. Well, that comes to the next question. And I have to say that um, water sheds, even though you know, you've talked about four seasons of fishing along the Rishabukto, a watershed is really the land that allows water to flow into the Rishabukto. So we'll go from the water to the land and maybe um, you can shed some light on your grampy and grandma and what they might think if they were to be alive today. Uh, what kind of things would they notice, you know, different? Yes, uh, so uh, my grandparents lived by, uh, right by, um, right by my parents' house and, um, and the, the area hasn't changed a lot. Uh, um, like, and now where I live, it's just back that way where my grandfather raised um, uh, cattle and he was a farmer as well. So, um, um, and, a, and a hunter. So uh, for me, I did a lot of um, uh, hunting myself and uh, enjoyed hunting. And we, I hunted mainly, uh, uh, birds like uh, uh, partridge and a lot of uh, rabbit hunting, a little bit of duck hunting, no geese or anything like that. Um, geese were very, very smart uh, in those days. Today, they, they could pretty well shoot them off the, the fields. And, but in those days, you couldn't get close to them because they, one little, if you were trying to sneak up on them through the forest, one little twig breaks, then they all take off, they all fly away. <laughs> Uh, so we did a, I did a little bit of hunting uh, for geese, but never successful. Uh, ducks, I was pretty successful. Partridge, I was very successful and, and rabbit hunting as well. And the area, what I learned from my grandfather is he, he would um, he take me and uh, my cousin uh, towards the um, uh, northern part of the uh, community uh, which, which he called it the Pkuotu, yeah, like that, yeah, right around there. And uh, he called it a Pkuotu. And um, that would mean uh, like a swamp, a swampy area. So we traveled through the um, uh, forest and uh, there was a path going through there. And we traveled uh, right, right over uh, Beaver Dam. There was a huge Beaver Dams there at the time. And uh, we would, um, uh, after we crossed uh, the beaver dam, then we'd go up a hill towards the Pkuotu. So when we got there, my, my grandfather would um, uh, bring out a, a, a moose horn. Uh, he, never, he never carried or he never took the moose horn with him when we were going up there. But when we get up there, then he just brings out a moose horn from, from he, it must have, he, must, he just must leave it there or something. Because every time we do go there, he won't carry it with him, but when we get there, he'll just dig it out of the, uh, the, the brush and the, the leaves and all that. Then he'd tell us to lay low and uh, he'd call out the, uh, the moose. And um, it's, it, you know, it's successful that um, the moose uh, does come, does come out and, you know, he would shoot the moose. Um, and uh, the, the, the problem was getting it out of the woods, which is, uh, uh, in those days, you know, it was way deep into the woods. So uh -huh. uh, once the moose was shot, uh, um, then um, my, my, you know, my, my, my grandfather would dress it and, you know, just clean it, gut it out and uh, what they usually do to a moose and, uh, uh, and then go back to the community and then uh, get the, uh, the men that would come, up, come to you and uh, haul out the moose piece, pretty well piece by piece. Uh, uh, sometimes they bring it up to the beaver dam and they get a boat and they, they would uh, uh, take it um, to, to the community right through the, uh, right by the, by the that brook that's there, which is, which is a brook today. But in those days, it was a, a, a beavers were able to uh, uh, put dams over there and uh, um, had these huge 
uh, lakes, I guess you could call them. Mm -hmm. And um, so um, that, that's, uh, and even today, the, uh, the, the moose uh, call that my grandfather did, uh, it's still, it, I still hear it. And I have tried it and um, in my in hunting and um, get a little embarrassed. You got to do it more, more often, I guess. <laughs> you get a little uh, embarrassed when you do it. And, um, but if you, you're good at it and, and the moves do, uh, uh, do come. And uh, that's, 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 how, that's how moose hunting was done. You call out the moose and the moose came out. Uh, very close to you and you shot the moose and that was meat and a livelihood for uh, for the, uh, the the extended families and mm -hmm. uh, once the moose is brought it brought to the uh, uh, community uh, then the, then all of uh, a good part of the community uh, men and women come over and they you know they observe the moose and a lot of meat is given away at, at that time to uh, uh, to the people that come out and uh, try to help out uh, with the moose. Mm -hmm. As for me growing up, I started hunting when I was uh, uh, very young, maybe 11, 12 years old. And um, I hunted with a 22 caliber rifle and um, hunted, um, like I said, partridge and uh, rabbit. And uh, I was always uh, success successful in, in the hunting. I loved it. I really enjoyed uh, being in the in the woods. And then a couple, maybe a couple years after that, maybe I was 14, 15 years old, I started getting into snaring uh, rabbits, and and I learned that from my 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 grandfather as well, um, and my dad as well. I should be mentioning my dad a little bit because he played a major a lot of role in, in that as well. They taught me how to um, set up a snare and, and uh, uh, you know, I would wake up around five o'clock in the morning before school, um, before high school. And uh, I would uh, uh, go check the snares and, and sure enough, I'd set maybe a dozen snares. I, ha I would have six or seven rabbits uh, um, uh, snared and, um, you know, I put those in a, a bur we had a burlap bag, put those in a bag and, and just take them home and uh, just leave them there in the cold weather. And, and at, the end of the, um, at the end of the school day, then we, we, we would clean those and, and uh, have our rabbit stew, which was very, very good. And, uh, but later on, when it was colder and colder, then what we did with the rabbit uh, that we snared was uh, took them to a uh, neighbor in Shabakto and there was a place there they, we sold the rabbits to, uh, to, to, to the people and I think they made a lot of uh, pies, uh, meat pies at that place and the, um, the fur of the rabbit, I think they got a, I think they sold that and they, um, you know, and, you know, later you started hearing uh, uh, fur, fur coats made out of rabbit and, and I think a lot of that came from the rabbits that we. I uh, wonder. I have a hat. And, uh, yeah, and uh, and the rabbits when you when you snare the rabbit, you don't damage the their 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 fur at all. You know, right? It doesn't have a bullet hole in it or anything. Yeah. So um, so they were um, they they uh, the rabbits served uh, a lot of purpose, and uh, I never believed a rabbit uh, fur coat, but there was a teacher here one time that had a fur coat that was a. That was made out of rabbit, and you right. touch it, and you you could tell it was a it was rabbit fur. Yeah, it's so that that's an interesting part of the part of the story. Um, and so so those would be the uh, cooler months, fall time. You know, uh, late September, October, November, December. A um, little bit of a, a bird hunting, maybe uh, January. Uh, but after that, the, the hunting season kind of quiets down. It's very cold and. Uh, and in the springtime, we we didn't no no one hunted in the springtime. Um, we we didn't shoot any uh, mm -hmm. uh, animals in the springtime. Um, we, we let uh, partridge and rabbits like replenish and, mm -hmm. um, and, and for the species to, uh, to to keep populating themselves and be ready for the um, uh, for the fall time. Yeah. So um, the, fall, the cooler seasons was when we uh, we hunted, and it, and that's still the the tradition uh, today. You, you 
and you do a lot of um, your hunting in the cooler seasons and you're fishing in the, in the, in the warmer seasons. Mm -hmm. so that was interesting um, uh, about hunting and um, my grandfather taking us up there um, specifically to teach us these skills. Uh, um, and and we, we've learned them much like the, the, uh, the bread being cooked in the, in the hot sand and the, um, the moose calling and the uh, uh, setting up your uh, snares and, and uh, never, um, uh, never wasting, uh, never wasting any of the uh, uh, animals that we, uh, hunt, that we hunted. Yeah, sweet. I just happened to uh, learn how to do a moose call from a, a friend years ago. I'd have to take my video off to try it because I'd be embarrassed, like you said. But yes. And he made it out of birch bark. Um, yes, yes, it made out of birch bark. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and you got to really and, put your body into it and send right, the that, horn up into the air and let her go. Yeah, that's, and that's, exact, that's exactly what you do. Yeah. And I, 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 I mentioned the embarrassment and being embarrassed because we don't do it enough. Um, uh, but if you, you know, went hunting and did it all the time, you, you wouldn't be embarrassed. So, right. and of course you have three or four other guys with you. And then if someone <laughs> breaks out into a laugh a little bit, <laughs> you don't want to do it again. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but, but, uh, but the, um, the, the hunters that are good with it, they're, you know, they're, 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 they're just so, uh, uh, into calling the, the, the moves that, um, it's nothing to them. It's it's yeah. something that they grew, grew up with. It's something that they learned, and it's something that they practice uh, every year in the fall, especially yeah. like late September. Me, some start. Some would start late August, uh, uh -huh. and Calling and that in. and in the cooler cooler evenings would be the best because um, um, uh, shooting a moose uh, uh, and killing a moose uh, in the warm seasons. That's you know, you got to be very careful with that. You, you know, there's a chance that your you, the, the moose meat will rot out on you because of the heat. So you want to do it uh, you wanna, in the cooler evenings of August and September. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah, it's beautiful to see. I think uh, every teacher needs a moose call in his or her classroom because guarantee it, yes, and, kids uh, get a kick out of it. And, and <laughs> to practice it. And uh, to practice it, uh, but it is, yes. But yeah, but it is quite quite the sight to be uh to to call out a moose You're right. and wait and wait and the moose does come out and yes and doesn't it require patience yes. so does fishing on the ice my land the only time i've ever ice fished was in a shack and that wasn't yeah. comfortable to me so <laughs> yeah i can't yeah. imagine winters were so much harsher too in the 70s were they not Yes, they were. Yeah, uh, today, uh, to, today uh, that we see a little, a few more shacks around the, in, in front of the river, right? To, uh, like this time of the year, right. uh, nowadays, I guess. And our school does a lot of outdoor learning. And one of the our outdoor uh, people there, our outdoor teacher, um, does set up shacks for our students to go there regularly. Yes. Um, uh, in fact, just last year, my boy was still in the in our program here, and um, on Saturdays and Sundays, he'd want me to 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 drive him up to that area, which is just down here. It's a it's a long walk from where we live, but I I drive him over there on Saturday afternoon, and he'd go into that shack and and fish there all afternoon on a Saturday and Sunday. Wow! And he enjoyed it, and he yeah. he just loved it, and, and uh, um, we. Right now, um, that program hasn't started yet because there's, you know, the ice is not quite safe yet. Um, yeah. But once once the ice uh, does does get, you know, to a certain thickness, the, our teacher's going to go out there, put a couple of those shacks, and take out our school kids to do ice fishing. Oh. Um, and uh, and the smelts that they catch, they they bring them to our school here for uh, for uh, for to to eat and cook and eat uh, as part of our cafeteria program. Uh, of course, COVID has put a little bit of damper on some of those plans, but uh, we won't we're talk still, about um, interested in doing some of that. Yes, sir. Oh, that's really.
fascinating. Maybe when we get out of orange, uh, for those watching, we are in currently an orange phase. <laughs> uh, I didn't give you any context to what the time was that we were interviewing. It is January yeah. 2021. <laughs> yes. So once we get out of this, I'll say pandemic, um, it would be a real treat to come up in the winter and in the summer and experience some of the Oh, the yes, one. absolutely. <clears throat> Super. Well, Ivan, moving right along, I, I hate to leave the map because I, I love how you refer to different areas of the watershed as you're speaking. Um, and I appreciate the, the sort of venture through the seasons as you go from the water to the land. And uh, I just want you to say it's so beautifully translated into Mi'kmaq and I have written it down but I have not mastered the pronunciation. Uh, learning from the land in Mi'kmaq and then um, what would you say personally your biggest lesson from her and I say her meaning the earth, water, land, air, soil, <laughs> the biggest lesson that she has to offer, and maybe that's not fair to say that there is one that's bigger than the other, but from your you know, personal experience, uh, do we have lots to learn? And are we doing our best? And I'm speaking from a public education perspective. Uh, are we doing the best that we can to use the land as a co-teacher. Yes, uh, absolutely. Um, and um, uh, is the, the term is. that uh, learning from the land. And uh, uh, is um, uh, land, is, yeah, okay, how to, Ma'amigo is um, like the, the, the surface, I guess of the of earth, I guess, the surface of the earth, Ma'amigo. Um, and Gegina uh, Mauti is what, what we learn from, from the, from the Ma'amigo. And um, so, um, again, growing up, uh, we learned a lot of things and uh, uh, from the land. And one of the stories I'd like is when I was a kid, just my, my grandparents are living right next to my, my mom and dad there in our house. And um, that area of the forest has not changed. Um, I don't want to say at all, but it hasn't changed a lot uh, because it's forested uh, wetland, that area where my grandfather. So as a kid, I remember um, I got a hold of my father's uh, axe and uh, when he wasn't around, of course. And, and uh, so I took that and walked towards the uh, back of the house and there was a and a tree there, so I started banging on the on the tree, trying to thinking I'm going to cut this tree. Um, but as I'm doing that, then my grandfather yells at me, "Bundum uh, dena uh, you know, loud voice, and uh, uh, saying, uh, "Stop cutting the trees." And and I I I didn't think there was anything wrong with that. But uh, that's what he said, and he just said to um, me, yes, I, I went home. But it was all, it always stuck in my mind, though, what he said there. And that's why I'm saying this story, because uh, at the time, I did not understand um, what he meant. It was just a tree that you cut down, because I didn't know the, the value of trees. I didn't know the importance of uh, trees and, and uh, uh, the, the role it plays in the in our whole uh, Mother Earth about uh, cleansing uh, uh, carbon dioxide and using carbon dioxide and bringing out oxygen and all the and all the things that science uh, uh, teaches us. Um, but my fr my grandfather would not explain it that way. He he wouldn't say you know the carbon dioxide or anything like that. He would just say that the the, the trees were um, uh, important. The trees were, were there for a reason. The trees are there to, to help us uh, people out and, uh, and the habitat that lives uh, 
amongst those trees. Um, so um, it took a long, long time for me to, to, to understand what he meant at that time. And so today, it is uh, very important that um, young people, students, uh, classroom students, uh, venture out to, to, to forest and learn from the, uh, uh, from the environment and learn from the rivers and lakes. Uh, um, as you know, Pam, we did some virtual learning here with our scientists uh, back in, the, in no October, November. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things that I learned uh, from, the, from the scientists was the, uh, the rivers and the, 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 the creeks and the, the, the uh, little streams that are flowing through a lot of, um, um, for, uh, a lot of these areas in the forest. And uh, one of the um, scientists said to, we're gonna bring these uh, little uh, nets, I guess, or uh, pail nets or spoon nets or something. And I was wondering why, why she would need that. And I did ask eventually why, why those nets? Well, we'll take a sample out of the water and let the water drain out in the nets and we'll see all these little wiggly things that are moving around in, the, uh, in, in what's left over in the water. And these are things that we don't see uh, in, our, in our water systems, but they're there for a reason. Uh, and uh, they're very important in the whole ecosystem of, uh, of, of the relationship that um, we as people have with the water and the trees and the air. And uh, everything is, is like in a, in a circle, like a mm -hmm. cycle and everything depends on, on, uh, on, on each other, like the interrelationships that uh, uh, the, the, the people, the human beings have with the, the surroundings. And um, that's one of the, 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 the biggest lessons I learned from my grandfather is just that we're all um, inter, in, interrelated in, in that aspect. And we gotta, you know, as much we take care of ourselves, but we gotta take care of the uh, uh, the land and the, the the oceans and the air that uh, that nourishes the uh, the, per, the, per, the people the person. So um, it's uh, having kids go out and learn some of, some of these things uh, uh, from the um, from the uh, from the forest from the rivers and um, that just adds to more of the authentic learning that kids uh, will learn. Uh, from uh, from scientists that do a lot of these outdoor lessons or outdoor classrooms, and we're beginning to see a lot, a lot, lot more of uh, outdoor learning activities. Uh, teachers are bringing into the schools, and uh, um, our school here is doing a lot of outdoor lessons. And um, I've been reading in the Moncton area that they've been having a lot of outdoor lesson classrooms as well, and and that is uh, that's, that, that's a very, very good thing for kids. Uh, our kindergarten teacher here was a little skeptical about uh, outdoor classrooms years, several years ago. And then she went to uh, a, a, a PD or professional development training in the outdoor classrooms. And uh, she came back here and tried it out. And the first thing she came out and said was the kids that were the quietest, the kids that were not the uh, speaking in the classrooms, um, never, hardly ever said a word. That's when when she took them out to the to the to the forest and uh, to the rivers. Then you, you, she started to see these kids talk a lot more and and uh, it relate more with the kids uh, uh, and their classmates. And she's seen a real value of outdoor education, outdoor classrooms, to a point that she put in a proposal to the organizations to ask for uh, um, 15 or 18 of uh, little rain jackets and rain boots and rain hats and, and stuff like that. So their outdoor education uh, does not have to be only on sunny days. They, they still go out on these rainy rainy days that uh, because there's, st there's still a lot of value in going out there in, in weather, in climate weather like rain and, and, they, and the kids learn a lot from it. Um, uh, we used to tell kids not to go into the muddy water. We, you know, we don't do that. We, we kind of let them explore what, what's in the muddy water and, 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 and uh, with their rain boots and so on. And, and uh, um, our experiences, we've seen a lot of learning going on uh, directly related to outdoor classrooms, to the forest, to the rivers, to the lakes, and, 
and to the uh, to the animals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree with you. And it's sometimes and, it's and, uh, when, and just 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 thinking about that when when we when we talk about uh, family literacy, mm -hmm. uh, you know, before colonial days, uh, a Mi'kmaq or a Ulnu or a First Nation family literacy would be that kind of learning, uh, that kind of literacy where um, the, 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 the family learned from the, from the environment, they learned from the water, they learned from the trees, they learned from the stars, the sun, uh, they learned from the air and they learned from the animals. So all that encompassed uh, family uh, literacy. Um, and, uh, and the Mi'kmaq family, the First Nation family still does believe that. Um, and um, we're, you know, uh, First Nation families are working a lot towards bringing that type of family literacy back to the, uh, to the, to the First Nation family. Yeah, well, I think uh, it would benefit, you know, many cultures and many students to do that. And it's, it's sometimes perceived, the outdoors is perceived as scary, cold, dark, full of germs, don't get dirty, don't, you know, don't play in the mud, <laughs> um, be in by dark. There, there's all kinds of reason to be afraid of the outdoors. And, and the other thing uh, often in education, it's, it's the classroom for the science teachers, but it, unfortunately, that's um, a myth, really. Yes, we can enjoy the outdoors as uh, a science classroom, no doubt, but it can also be a space where um, imagination can be sparked and, and, you know, quiet times can be sought out and literacy can be taught and so can math and so can history and so can, so yes. uh, yeah there's a whole whole uh you know reason and especially in the midst of a pandemic when we're encouraged to get outdoors and and you know you know commune with nature spend time off the screens and socially and exercise that um, the outdoor classroom should be a little more uh, of interest right now. And mm -hmm. maybe that's helping. Uh, yes, yeah, people, absolutely. Yeah, investigate, yeah. you know, and, and trust it that, you know, it, it, it does have a lot to teach and the, the little critters, the little invertebrates in the water we don't see, trust they're there indicating to us all kinds of things about the quality of the water and and what's going on around that we we can listen to and and pay attention to for sure yes yeah, yeah. i i remember um in my uh i must have been in grade seven in the uh, provincial school system and um uh, we had a project to do um about about forest and uh um uh, so on one of these trips, my grandfather took me out to the Kuatu, which is over the beaver dams and up those hills and up to that area. Um, I, I picked a lot of uh, uh, leaves and stuff that was on that path. And I had a whole bunch of these in my uh, hunting bag and took them to, uh, brought them home. And I put them in a scrapbook uh, for the uh, science teacher as a project. Uh, uh, in, in our school and our, uh, our science teacher was very impressed with the stuff that I collected on that trip going up to, with my grandfather on that hunting trip. Uh, what, I, what interested me, the, uh, uh, I mean, everything interested me at the time, but what I found interesting was those beaver dams and um, the, the beavers and the, uh, how uh, they're able to, to block water off like that and the, the incredible things the beavers are so, constructive and um, as kids we used to go there and take the beaver uh, you know take that break try to break the dam and uh, oh, and the water would start to flow again but but we go back the next day you know the dam still the dam is uh, already repaired by the by the beavers no. it was only that, that I found very interesting was uh, they, they there was a huge amount of beaver dams going up to the main highway and to a point that at the main highway, uh, one side of the highway had very high water and very little water on the other side. 
podcast, the Beavers plug the, the Calvert. And um, so uh, they were, uh, there was very a lot of concern that it's going to wash away the, the, the bridge or the uh, causeway type of uh, bridge. So the divers uh, went under there and uh, were able to put some, set some dynamite or explosive to blow apart that. And when that happened, there, it caused a gush of tons of water to flow down to where all these um, beavers had set up their lodges and their dams. And uh, it wiped out all those dams. It, 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 it was just a stream flowing through there. Uh, just back where I lived there, uh, there was a uh, beavers uh, kind of like shell shock swimming around an area where um, swimming around an area where they were just totally lost and uh, you know felt bad for the beavers they don't know what hit them that time but the interesting thing about that is they've never went back to that area to 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 build their 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 lodges to build <coughs> beaver dams but they they did build further up you know where the uh, they still had dams and they're still there yeah. So um, it, that, to me, that was just through observation and, and knowing that river, I, uh, <laughs> and knowing that river, I, um, oh, no, knowing that brook there, because um, uh, I used to fish, and there was there's a lot of there was a lot of trout in in those in those uh, huge be uh, dam beaver dams, and and uh, there were like lakes in the in the. Uh, you know, six or seven lakes right in the in the woods, and um, I used to fish a lot there and and explore going up towards the highway it was a good hike, um, and uh, that's the first thing I I noticed is the those river those brooks are there now but no um, no no evidence of beavers at all not they never went back. Yes, sir. Wow, and you've named a. Uh, uh, Education center after the beaver too, and Elsie, haven't you? Gopit Lodge named after yes, the beaver. Uh, <laughs> yes, Gopit Lodge, uh, and env environmental uh, people that are always uh, working with the uh, with the environment and making sure that the environment is is uh, respected. Yeah, super. Well, Ivan, I can't thank you enough for your time. I can tell by your phone that you are a busy man. <laughs> Just. Uh, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for taking the time out to do this. It was a pleasure, and I am sure we could talk for another hour or two. And uh, yes, uh, there's just one thing I wanted to mention absolutely. about about the um, about one of the questions you had there about and my parents seeing a change. Mm -hmm. like if my grandfather was alive today, he'd st he'd step out of his house and he'd still see that area back of his house back of my house he'll still that see that area has hasn't changed at all yeah. just a little bit just a little bit um the ant the the partridge that uh, had feeding grounds there they're still there the, the rabbits not so much because of the dogs roaming around um but that area there in the in the uh, floor to where he used to take me for the uh, hunting uh now those that's all like development houses and that's the that's the changes he would see is the amount of um, uh, uh, habitat uh, for uh, animal habitat that has changed to de to development to houses and uh, um, community development that's that's continues to be growing out into these areas and and um, and uh, you know in philosophy you ask yourself why develop but that's just how you know how the community is is moving and getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And uh, yeah. we got to be developing a lot of these areas. And it's a, it's a shame, but um, we still got a lot of those areas that we're trying to designate as uh, forested uh, wetlands. Well, no this is it. Yeah, we can protect them despite the development and the influx to the in entire province of New Brunswick right now is, is going to put a demand on water and trees and all you know, prices are, are changing too. Your grandfather would probably notice the price of a uh, pelt has gone yes. up drastically <laughs> since yes. he was selling them. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 
Well, fantastic. I hope that this is appreciated by all those who are listening. And I would like to say thank you, Walalan. And I look forward to meeting you in person again soon, Ivan. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Walalio. Walalan. Yay! That was great. Oh my goodness, I could listen. Look at the notes that I took. I think what I need to do is send your video out with some questions and people can, it'd be just like seeing you live. They can yeah. answer questions, but I, I'm going to ask you a few things that I missed. And particularly some of the words that you said in Mi'kmaq. Yes. Like the place you went to collect your leaves and yeah. go pid and uh, learning from the land. And I'll make a little matchy column and the kids mm -hmm. can try when they're listening to you yeah. do the translation. And yes, I think okay. especially the, the kids in Elsie who probably know you, yes, um, yeah. that, that'll be really exciting to, to hear your stories. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've never eaten an oyster and I've never eaten an eel. And I've oh, heard- Oh, Jay, you're, miss, you're missing out. I am, I, I've ice fished, but not out in the wild. I yeah. can't imagine an eel, but I am told that if they're cooked properly, they are to die for. Yes, so yes, yeah. Put that on my 2021 bucket list. Yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> it's uh, the, the salt water, especially the salt water eels. They're, okay. yeah. they're very good. Um, the, um, the, like in the St. John River, like up uh, Kingsclear and those First Nation communities, they